I'm going to talk about feature learning in infinite with neural networks, and uh, uh, I'm going to just dive straight into it. Um, so the plan for today are a uh, couple fold. So we're going to first talk about why pre-training transfer learning requires feature learning. Uh, then we briefly review uh, some of the current theory uh, revolving around your tangent kernel. And then we'll talk about uh, our proposal, which is the feature learning limit of neural networks. So uh, pre-training and transfer learning uh, is very successful uh, in deep learning. And uh, there's no more prominent examples than uh, ImageNet, ResNet on the image domain and uh, BERT GPT-3 uh, and so on on the uh, NLP domain. And um, in both cases, uh, pre-training and transfer learning cannot happen without feature learning. Uh, and before I explain why I say this, uh, which might come as really obvious to some of you, but might be more, uh, needs more justification for others. Uh, so before I justify it, let me, let me just be very straight about what I mean by feature learning uh, in this talk. So uh, any neural network you can express uh, the structure of the neural network as simply a composition of two functions. The first function is a nonlinear embedding function from input space to like this, the hidden layer uh, of the neural network. Uh, and then uh, there's another linear map from the hidden layer, uh, which, which you can think of as embedding space uh, to the output space, uh, which usually is like the label space, right? Like, so you output a, um, uh, logits over labels, and then via softmax, you can output probabilities. Um, so by feature learning, I mean the embedding function is learned. Um, and uh, just to briefly uh, review how uh, the, the pre-training and fine-tuning paradigm right now works. Um, right now, in during pre-training, you train a really large model on a very large uh, data set. Sorry, somebody raised their hand. I don't know if I should. Uh, so is a paradigm that I should respond immediately or? Uh, so if you have a question, uh, rather than raising your hand, just put it in the Q&A or the chat. Uh, so folks in the audience, go ahead and, and do that. All right, cool. So I'll just keep going, right? Uh, so yeah, pre-training, during pre-training, uh, so um, for example, uh, ImageNet uh, and uh, GPT-3, uh, during pre-training, you train on a very large data set from a general domain, uh, usually without a lot of labels, um, for example, in the GPT-3 case. Uh, but in ImageNet, you do have a lot of labels. Uh, but you train on a very large data set, and then during the transfer stage, you, uh, you care about this like actually very specific uh, subdomain uh, where you want to apply your model to and you uh, collect very uh, expensive but well-labeled data in that domain, and then you apply your pre-trained data, uh, pre-trained model, and then you, you train it a little bit on the, the small data set. And usually, what you find is that the performance of such a transfer network is much much better than if you train from scratch on this small data set from the get-go. Um, and the way we usually do this. Uh, is first we discard the readout layer from the pre-training. So just to be clear, readout means like this uh, linear layer that goes from the, the last hidden layer of the neural network to the output space. So you discard this layer. And this is just because during pre-training, you usually have a different objective uh, and different output space than the downstream tasks you're actually interested in. So just kind of like for type checking reasons, you have to discard it anyway. Um, and there are two very popular ways of doing this fine tuning. Uh, so in the linear fine tuning case, you just train a new readout layer of the right type, right? Like if you wanna classify cats and dogs, you would uh, train a new layer with output, output dimension two. Um, and uh, so, the, so it's very easy to see that if pre-training improves linear fine tuning, then the embeddings, i.e. the features of the inputs must change during pre-training, right? I mean, like the, the, pre, the fine tuning stage is entirely a linear problem. It only depends on the, the performance that only depends on the embeddings, the quality of the embeddings. Um, so this, in this particular case of linear fine tuning, this, this justifies uh, 
why I say that um, transfer learning really requires feature learning. Um, there's another popular way of doing fine tuning, which is called total fine tuning, uh, where you train the entire neural network, not just the last layer. Uh, you can actually get the same conclusion, though the logic is a bit more involved. So I won't go into detail here, but uh, the point is that in the end, my point stays that transfer learning really requires you to do feature learning. All right, so now let's look at um, how current theory uh, deals with uh, uh, transfer learning or feature learning. So um, the, one of the most popular uh, theories nowadays is called uh, this thing called neural tangent kernel. Uh, the idea is actually very simple. So uh, we take the neural network function f of x with parameters data and we just uh, do a naive first or for first order Taylor expansion around the initialized uh, value. Uh, I don't know if you can see my uh, mouse cursor or not. Um, but yeah, it's uh, yes. Yeah, Sorry, what's your? You can see it. Okay. Um, yeah, and uh, so you do a first order Taylor expansion, uh, and you can write this difference. Uh, of essentially the change in the neural network due to changing the parameters uh, as this inner product between the gradient of f with respect to the parameters and the change in the parameters. Um, and you can rewrite this as a kernel equation where the change of f in the function space is equal to essentially a kernel times the loss derivative and the kernel is this kernel induced by the gradient uh, of the, the function. Uh, evaluate it at the initial parameters. Um, so the really nice thing about this, of course, is that you essentially have linearized a really complicated dynamics of training a nonlinear neural network. And uh, as a result, you, you if essentially in this particular framework, if you look in the function space, uh, then the optimization landscape actually becomes convex, kind of like this uh, figure this uh, animation illustrates. Um, and uh, theoretically, this is easy to analyze. Uh, and we can obtain a lot of optimization generalization results. Uh, really, I think for the first time, uh, for really complicated neural networks um, that was not really uh, in reach before. So from a theoretical angle, this, this is actually what a very significant uh, framework to think about neural networks, large neural networks. But the, the very um, crucial drawback of this framework is that this particular NTK limit does not learn features. So pre-training is no better than random initialization uh, in the NTK limit. So, you know, this statement, again, you know, could be really obvious to some of you, but some other of you might uh, require some justification. So let me do that uh, very quickly. Um, so again, we have the you know first order tail expansion uh, framework for uh, NTK, um, and of course, first order tail expansion really only works if the change uh, in the parameters here is not very large, right? So if new NTK describes actual neural networks, and it must be the case that theta minus theta zero is small. But then uh, this implies that the embedding function cannot change too much, which implies that essentially the features uh, don't change, right? So this is just like a very, very simple uh, intuition about why in the NTK limit, you do not have feature learning. Uh, of course, like the real math is a bit more complicated than that. But here's a very vivid example uh, to show that uh, the NTK limit doesn't uh, learn features. So um, in this example, uh, I trained Wurtevec uh, embeddings uh, of a bunch of different words, but here is a US, words corresponding to US cities and states. Uh, and I did a PCA of the learned uh, embeddings in, uh, uh, into a two-dimensional space. And the models I trained here are or first uh, with 64, so 64 dimensional embedding orthovec, just like the conventional orthovec. Uh, 
uh, on the left, I uh, computed the same thing for the NTK limit. So essentially, you know, like uh, like the theoretical limit of the entire Ortovec training procedure in the NTK limit. And then on the right, uh, I did the same thing. Essentially, I, I took the feature learning limit, which I'll describe uh, later what exactly is meant by this. But I took the feature learning limit of the Ortovec uh, training procedure, the neural network, and, uh, and the resulting infinite width embeddings are projected into two dimensions via uh, PCA. Um, and the thing you should take away from these plots is that uh, whereas, you know, in the NTK case, the two types of words, US cities and US states, are essentially like all mixed together uh, in the 2D space. Uh, in the final width case with 64, you can see some natural separation between the two types of words indicating that the, uh, the ge geometry of the word embedding uh, really encoded some semantic information of the words. And furthermore, in the infinite width case, uh, you have an even more clean natural separation between the two clusters, the two types of words, uh, compared to the finite width case. So this kind of indicates that uh, one, um, NTK is not uh, the right uh, limit to, to take to understand feature learning, which was very, made very obvious by the contrast between the first plot and the second two plots. And two, um, the feature learning limit that I'll describe very quickly, very soon, um, will uh, be a very natural notion of uh, feature learning as you have this kind of natural increase in the semantical content of the learned word embeddings. Um, a quick question, Greg, from the audience. Yeah. Uh, so the is the neural tangent kernel the only sort of kernel that you can uh, that you can use there? Are there other potential choices there? Yeah, a uh, good question. So essentially, uh, it, it doesn't matter which kernel it is, as long as in the kernel style limit, you're gonna get the same thing. So it's not a, it doesn't depend on what the kernel itself is. It's just that one, as soon as you have a kernel, it doesn't work. So I'll talk about actually uh, very quickly a bit later, essentially you have a dichotomy between um, kernel limits, uh, just like the NTK, uh, and you have uh, the other categories of feature learning limit. And essentially like any um, natural, in some sense, natural limit of a neural network is either one of them, but we cannot have both. So if you wanna do feature learning, then it's definitely not a kernel limit. Okay, so uh, let me move on. Um, okay, so uh, let me just give you one more quick plot on uh, some numbers, concrete numbers uh, on word vec so in word of vec uh, you know, you learn these embeddings, but you kind of, of course, you know, you, you want to use them actually downstream. And uh, you can use them in very many different ways, but academically, a very common evaluation task is or analogy, which, is, which asks this kind of famous question, what to a queen is a man to a woman? It sounds real, real philosoph philosophical, but um, it just, it's, a, it's a collection of these analogy questions um, that that you use the word embeddings learn to answer via some algebraic manipulations. Um, but I'm not going to talk about the details of how the, the actual evaluation is done, but let me just highlight some numbers. Uh, in the plot here, uh, uh, we evaluated a bunch of different word to vec embeddings. Uh, well, for the final ones, we have uh, width or dimension embedding from two to the sixth power to two to the tenth power. Uh, and then we have the infinite width feature learning limit that I'll explain very soon. Uh, and then uh, finally, we have the NTK limit. So uh, there are a couple different takeaways. Uh, first is that the NTK uh, limit, of course, has essentially zero performance on word analogy 
And uh, like I said, that's because NTK doesn't really learn anything. This, the, the word embedding is essentially random. Like it's just the same, essentially from uh, as the initialization of the, um, of the training procedure. So like during evaluation, you're essentially just doing random guessing. Uh, and because the number of words is so large, uh, when you do random guessing on this plot, you cannot actually see the real number. Uh, it's just essentially the same as zero. Um, and in contrast, of course, like finite width and infinite with feature learning or to vex have uh, non-trivial performances. Uh, and then the other thing um, you can notice is that uh, on the x-axis, x-axis, I have the epoch. Um, so this is the, tr the training time uh, of the models. And uh, you can see that as uh, uh, width increases, which corresponds to the color becoming darker, uh, at every point in the uh, training procedure, the, uh, the wider the model is, the better the training uh, performance. And actually, sorry, um, this is uh, the y axis is actually the evaluation uh, on downstream tasks. So it's, it's actually like test performance. Uh, but, but what I'm saying here is that at any given time during the training, if you take that partial model, partially trained model, and evaluate it on the downstream task, you see a uniform increase in performance as the width increases. So this indicates that you know this, this feature learning limit that I'm about to uh, introduce to you uh, is the right notion. It, it captures feature learning in a meaningful way, such that as with increases, the performance also increases, and presumably the you know the the features learned that actually becomes more and more meaningful. But we also have similar results on meta learning on MAML, uh, but I mean essentially the takeaways are the same. So I'm not going to actually talk about it in this talk. All right, so now we'll get to the juicy part where we actually talk about the feature learning limit. Um, so before I begin, let me just give you uh, some way to, to frame this, to think about the different kinds of possible limits. Um, and uh, I think the right way to think about it is that for any you know, finite neural network, you know, when you write PyTorch code, you assume some parameterization of your neural network. Right. I mean, like just as concrete examples, you know, when you write PyTorch code, you use uh, by default like Wukun initialization, so like fan in initialization, um, and every such parameterization induces some kind of infinite width limit or infinite width training dynamics. Uh, if you just you know naturally just change your width number in your code from a thousand to ten thousand to hundred thousand, and so on and so forth. You know, assuming you have the compute to actually run this computation, then the the um, dynamics of your neural network uh, will actually converge to something as you increase that width number in your code. So, so my point here is that every parameterization corresponds to an inf infinite width dynamics, and the feature learning limit that I've been talking about, and I'm gonna be more concrete on is induced by this thing we call the maximal update parameterization, which uh, I'll describe shortly. But uh, just before that, let me quickly give you a big picture of what's going on. Um, so in general, you have a lot of different parameterizations. And there's a way to formalize this into something called ABC parameterizations, but I'm not going to go into details about this in this talk. Uh, but I'll briefly give you some pointers later. Uh, but you have the space of possible parameterizations, which includes, you know, the neural tangent uh, parameterization and the standard parameterization, like the Lacoon initialization, whatever you use in PyTorch, or um, mean field parameterization, which is more relevant in the theoretical literature. Um, most of them are going to induce unstable or trivial limits in the sense that, like, training dynamics in the infinite width limit will blow up, or like the uh, the neural network, the infinite width neural network will not move uh, during training from initialization. Um, but within those that are stable and non-trivial, uh, most of them are going to be in the kernel regime, so they're going to induce kernel limits. So in particular, neural tangent is a prominent example, but also standard parameterization uh, with 
the appropriate learning rate. Uh, but if you use the standard, if you actually use the standard uh, parameterization with a constant learning rate, uh, things are actually going to blow up. So it's it's going to be unstable. Uh, and the thing, the maximal update parameterization that I'm going to introduce next uh, is essentially like this vertex in this very small region uh, that actually does feature learning. And this being a vertex means that is maximal in some sense. Uh, colloquially, you can understand this as saying that you, if there's features to be learned, it learns the features. Okay, uh, that's all I'm going to say about this, the big picture. Now let me drop down into something concrete. Uh, let me tell you about the maximal update parameterization, uh, which is abbreviated as MUP. Um, so let's be very concrete. I'm going to tell you how what this parameterization actually is. Um, and the easiest way to understand this is to modify the standard parameterization to get a maximal update parameterization. So um, you need to make two, uh, two changes to the standard parameterization. And I'll tell you about why, uh, intuitively, why we need those changes. Um, but uh, the first change is in the last layer. And the reason why we need to make that change is because in standard parameterization, um, the last layer, essentially one is too large parameterization, and two, uh, it gets too much gradient. And uh, with this modification, essentially the purpose is to well, make the last layer a bit smaller and also make, the, make its gradient a bit smaller. Uh, and this is so that you can use a larger learning rate such that like all the uh, previous layers get more gradient. Okay, so uh, the concretely what we do is we divide the logics by square root of n and you use a constant learning rate. So you can see here, uh, there's a one over square root of n factor at the end of the neural network. And the last layer weights are, are sampled the usual way using the Lacoon or Fanning initialization. Um, and this alone suffices to enable feature learning. And let me remind you that in the standard parameterization, in the figure I just showed you, if you don't divide by square root of n uh, and you use a constant learning rate, essentially, uh, as, you, as you train a really, really wide neural network, the um, output of the neural network will blow up. And as well as the um, lot, uh, pre activation of the neural network will blow up. Um, okay, so second modification is in the first layer. Uh, uh, and the intuition of why we need to make this modification is that in standard parameterization, the first layer actually gets very little gradient compared to the rest of the neural network. So, uh, you know, taking a slightly larger picture, essentially in the standard parameterization, the last layer gets too much gradient, the middle gets okay amount of gradient, and the first layer gets too little gradient. So we're fixing the problem in the first layer. Uh, and uh, the easy fix here is that we multiply the pre-activation by square root n and we use fan out initialization. So here's a square root n in the pre-activation of the first layer and uh, the weights are sampled like fan out, right? So one over n, where n is the output dimension. Um, and uh, so this will serve to increase the gradient by n. Uh, this is needed to enable feature learning in every layer. All other weights are initialized kind of the same way using fan initialization. Um, okay, so uh, so that's essentially uh, the maximal update parameterization. Um, now, next part of the talk, uh, most of it is going to be about giving you uh, some intuition of how to compute this limit. Um, the gist of the story is that you can you can essentially compute the limit for any neural network uh, and essentially any algorithm. Um, like essentially if you have a, a PyTorch code describing uh, whatever you're trying to do, uh, anything in deep learning, you can convert it uh, systematically to a computation for an infinite width neural network and a way to compute that limit. Uh, but I'm going to focus very, very specifically um, on 
a one-hidden layer linear neural network as a motivating example. Uh, so I'll go into that very shortly. Now let me go a bit one level deeper into the intuition of how to compute this. And this is given by this quote. Uh, when width is very large, every activation vector has roughly ID coordinates. So at any time during training, uh, uh, and using tensor programs, we can recursively calculate such coordinate distributions and consequently understand how the neural network function evolves. Okay, so you know if you have been doing some calculations with NTK, you might be familiar with the first sentence uh, in the sense that initialization, every activation vector has roughly ID coordinates. Uh, but this is at initialization, not any time during training. So I need to justify why uh, at any time during training, every activation vector has roughly ID coordinates. Um, and then uh, I'll briefly touch on how um, we can recursively calculate such coordinate distributions. All right, so as a motivating example, let's look at a linear 100 layer neural network. Um, so assume input and output dimension are both one. Um, then uh, in the, in the, the neural network can be represented by uh, two essentially vectors, right? Because the input and output dimensions are one. So the first layer and second way, layer weights are both vectors. Um, and uh, a four pass is represented by essentially the multiplication of these two vectors times the input, which is a scalar. Um, we're gonna have ID coordinates initialization, uh, initialized accordingly, essentially the variance one over n, but we won't need that detail until later. Um, okay, so let's look at uh, what happens in the first four pass. Um, Again, F is the uh, scalar product of the two vectors uh, times the input. And because it's a scalar product, the sum of a large number of uh, roughly ID elements, uh, which specifically are like first layer, like first layer element times second layer element, right? And uh, these things are ID across the width dimension. Um, so as width becomes larger and larger, f of i will converge to something, to some deterministic number by low large numbers, uh, which in this uh, specific case of a random initialization is just zero. Okay, so if f converges, then the loss derivative of f also converges, right? Usually because um, loss derivative is a continuous function. So if f converges in this continuous image of f, uh, has to converge. All right, now let's look at the first backward pass. Um, in particular, let's look at the gradients of the weights. Uh, so you can do a very simple calculation, but the point here is that um, the gradient of the second layer is essentially the first layer weights times uh, these two scalars, the input times the loss derivative. And similarly, the first layer gradients or the second layer weights times these two scalars. Um, and like I said, the scalars are roughly deterministic. I mean, xi, the input is essentially, is, is by definition is deterministic. And the loss derivative is deterministic because f converges and l prime is continuous. So uh, the structure of this gradients uh, actually implies that both layers gradients are approximately ID. So when you add the gradients to the weights uh, via the first gradient step, uh, you maintain this property that the weights have approximately ID coordinates. And uh, something else we can observe is that, um, of course, like at this point in time, in the second four pass, the weights are uh, linear combinations of the original weights from initialization, right? Um, and this fact will be important for uh, calculating the infinite width limit later on. But for now, uh, we don't actually need it. Okay, so, so let's keep going forward uh, and see what's happening uh, elsewhere in the four, second four pass. Um, the computation of F again uh, implies that it converges by low large numbers because 
it's a sum of large number of ID uh, things. And uh, the last derivative converges as well because F does. And uh, again, the gradients have the same structure. That means that they have uh, approximately ID coordinates. And you know, when you update, the weights remain uh, roughly ID. So, uh, so this logic, you know, obviously re repeats for all times. And this justifies what I said earlier about how when the width is large, every activation vector has roughly ID coordinates at any time during training. And the stress is on at any time during training, right? All right. Um, now, uh, earlier I also said that weights at any time are linear combinations of weights from initialization. And this is uh, already hinted at by the calculation we did earlier. Uh, and um, using this observation, uh, we can see how to calculate the infinite width limit without res resorting to actual an actual neural network. So let me just give you an overview of uh, what is involved. So let me establish some quick notations. I'll let you denote the first layer of weights and V denote the second layer of weights. And in particular, without the subscripts, I'm gonna just uh, use them to denote the initialized values, so the random initialization uh, of the weights. And um, initialization, they are sampled with variance one over n, where n is a width. Okay, and uh, additionally, another piece of notation is that during the t plus one four pass, you can use subscript t to denote the, va the, the particular values of u and v at, at that time. So when I say, uh, you know, weights at any time are linear combinations of weights from initialization, this implies that for any t, there are coefficients a t, b t, c t, d t, which converge roughly deterministically such that, you know, v, we can write vt equal to a t times v plus b t times u, u t equals c t times v plus d t times u, where again, u and v without subscripts are denoting the initial values of the um, weights. And uh, of course, um, when t was zero and translation, uh, at and dt are one and bt and ct uh, are zero. Uh, sorry. Um, okay, so with that said, uh, we can look at what happens during the t plus one four pass. And uh, essentially via the same kind of law large number intuition, we can see that f of xi equals at times ct plus cbt times dt times xi. And this is, you can get this by just kind of uh, expanding the product of vt times ut and noticing that because u and v, again, they refer to the initialized values, u and v are independent. So there's no correlation between the uv and vu cross terms. So the only terms that survive are via contracting v with v and u with, with, with u. And uh, that results in the terms ac and bd. And then we can invest, investigate the uh, t plus one backward pass. And, uh, you know, along the same lines of what we did before, we can notice that uh, the gradients are also linear combinations of uh, the initial u and v's, right? In particular, they take these particular forms. And um, when you make the updates, now it's very apparent uh, how the A's and the B's, the C's and T's will update uh, after this particular time, like so. Okay, so um, I hope this convinces you that uh, you can repeat this logic you know, over and over. And uh, the point here is that to compute this infinite width limit, you only need to compute uh, the values of A and B and C and D across time. And if you want to train for a thousand steps, you just have to calculate uh, what the values of A, B, C, D at time a thousand is. And you can do this via these recursive formulas.
and they're summarized here. So again, we're in the context of this linear well hidden layer neural network for illustration purposes. And uh, here we have the input and output dimension equal to one and learning rate equal to one. And then in the infinite width limit, we have that um, at any time the function, the neural network F is equal to AC plus BD times the input xi, where uh, A, B, C, D are updated like so, with the initial condition that A and D are one and B and C are zero. All right, so if you've been paying a bit of attention, uh, then you might notice that this looks awfully like a linear one hidden layer with two neural network, where uh, the hidden dimension corresponds to A, B, and C, D. So in particular, A, B are the second layer weights and C, D are the first layer weights. Uh, but you know, in contrast to how people usually train their neural networks, what's different is the initialization. So here we have some kind of quote unquote diagonal initialization which can be summarized by this matrix equation in contrast to you know, random initialization that people usually have. So we can summarize um, this whole box uh, as this kind of uh, uh, like psychological uh, equality. So in other words, feature learning limit of a linear one hidden layer neural network with random initialization is equivalent to a width d in plus d out a linear one hidden layer neural network with diagonal initialization. So we instantiated this with d and d out equal to one. Uh, but this is in general true for any uh, input and output dimension. You can generalize this logic very easily. And in fact, um, this equality is essentially what we use to compute uh, the large scale experiments like Wartovec. And just to be very concrete in that particular example of word of vec, D and D out are the vocab sizes, which are like 140K to 280K depends on the data set. All right, so let me just summarize uh, what we've been through just now. Um, in the one layer case, the way matrices have ID coordinates initialization, the function output converges due to low large numbers. Gradients have approximately ID coordinates. So after gradient update, weight coordinates are still approximately ID. And then you can repeat this logic. So this, this should convince you that um, the weights at any, at any given time have approximately ID coordinates. Uh, but first, like, they're gonna be uh, correlated across weights. Uh, and then in the linear case, we can express the weights at any given time as linear combinations of weights from initialization. This allows us to have efficient calculation of the limit. All right, so that was one hand layer. Uh, let me give you an appetizer for the deeper case where the math will actually uh, significantly become more complex. So I don't have any room to give you the full, full course, but an appetizer should suffice. So the main difficulty here is that you have this n times n Gaussian random matrix W in the middle of the network, which comes from the random initialization of weights. Um, so it has two kinds of behaviors that you have to keep track of. One is essential limit behavior, which is essentially you know, something you're familiar with if you have done NTK calculation before. But essentially here, you know, if X is a vector independent of W, then WX is a Gaussian vector. Um, the other thing is that you have to you have to be careful about how W uh, correlate with W transpose, right? Like you know, during SGD, if you use W in the forward pass, then you have to use W transpose in the backward pass. So um, this correlation actually doesn't matter so much for the calculation of NTK, uh, because that only depends essentially on the first backward pass. But if you do more than one step of SGD. Uh, you'll see this occurring. So, so it's, it's, it's important to kind of be careful about both of these uh, behaviors and kind of keep track of them in, in a systematic way. And that's by no means a trivial thing. 
and you know, this series is called Tensor Program Series, and there were like three papers, you know, four if you count the zero paper, I guess, before this. And the the crux of the mathematical foundation is to deal with uh, this complexity here. Um, yeah, and in the framework, this tensor program machinery essentially automates all of these derivations. So essentially, even if you don't know anything about probability theory, you can just read the the, the, the machinery as an algorithm, and as a you know as an as an engineer, you can just implement this and can automatically translate between uh, PyTorch code and you know infinite width neural networks. Um, uh, I'm almost done, but let me just highlight some other results in the papers. So to give you uh, some pointers, if you're interested. Uh, we isolate a natural class of parameterizations, which I briefly mentioned before as the ABC parameterizations, uh, which contains the NTK, you know, mean field standard uh, parameterizations, as well as the maximum other parameterization I introduced here. Um, I classify, we classify these parameterizations uh, essentially into either feature learning uh, parameterization, which induces a feature learning limit, or kernel parameterization, uh, like NTK. But you cannot have both. So it's a dichotomy. And this gives you some interesting consequences. Uh, one is that certain functional dynamics are not valid infinite with limits. So in other words, you know, it's not like if you just you know grab something from the bag, some some kind of dynamics, some functional dynamics, but then there's a neural network that corresponds to that in the infinite width limit. Now that's not the case. And you know, I give you some concrete examples. For example, higher order generalizations of NTK dynamics. So like I think this example is actually very pertinent because a lot of people after the NTK uh, paper essentially just try to expand more terms instead of first order Taylor expansion you do higher order Taylor expansion and they're saying that um, essentially like doing that doesn't give you valid limits um, and another interesting consequence is that any feature learning limits function values must be zero everywhere initialization <clears throat> so this contrasts with for example in the NTK limit the initialization uh, is a GP, is a Gaussian process in the infinite width limit. And what this, say, what this is saying is that if you have a Gaussian process initialization, that means your last layer uh, initialization is too large. And this prevents you from using a large learning rate to make the body of the network learn features. So you should initialize so that the last layer is smaller, uh, and then you use a large learning, larger learning rate so that the, the features are learned. Okay, so that's it. I'm gonna end here. And um, here are some QR codes to the paper and a longer two hour talk with more details in case you're interested in further. Um, yeah, thanks. And I'll take any questions you have. Great, um, I've got lots, but folks in the audience, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, the thing I wanted to start off with, I think was, um, so you noted that the standard parameterization that everybody uses is unstable, that you can't essentially take an infinite mm -hmm. width limit with it. Do you think that that's something, do you think that that's something that's actually a benefit for working with finite width networks? Or do you think that switching over to a parameterization like the maximal update one, scaling down our logics, scaling up our inputs, do you think that's something that would actually make this like finite width neural networks have better properties, perform better? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, so uh, this is also, it's a good question, but it's also a very subtle question. And uh, in some sense, it requires a paper to answer, and that's what's coming next uh, in the series. Uh, but let me give you at least like some overview uh, or like some of the punchlines perhaps, not, not into details, but um, some vague punchlines. So um, it's a, I say it's a subtle question because um, if you only, if you fix your width, like your width is finite, uh, then really like all the parameterizations are the same up to constants, right? Like, because, you know, if your n is a finite number, 
then you can uh, you can insert constants in front of like the one over n or whatever, such that you can con you can just go for between different parameterizations uh, very freely, uh, and uh, and as an as an aside, you know, like everything I talked about here, uh, uh, I say that one over n or something, really, you know. Uh, the the thing that matters is the scaling with n, and I say one over n because I want to simplify the presentation. But you know, in practice, if you want to implement these, like the constants in front of the one over n and you know, whatever power of n is actually very important. So, um, if you put all those constants in, then like I said, uh, you can essentially go between all the different parameterizations as as long as soon as you fix the width, right? And uh, what is important and what's, what is important indicated by all of this, um, this material is uh, not that one prime tradition is better than another one uh, if you fix the width, but rather if you, you know, fix the prime transition and you let width go to infinity, then one is better than another, right? Like it's, it's a scaling behavior that really matters. Um, so, okay, so, Maybe this is a roundabout way of answering a question, but uh, this is what I mean by subtlety. And so you cannot make a statement, or it kind of doesn't really make sense to make a statement saying, oh, one parameterization is better than another parameterization uh, for, for a particular finite width neural network uh, in the context of this kind of parameterization where you know, I, I'm really talking about scaling with width. Um, but you can um, you can talk about certain things you cannot do um, uh, before, but you can do now if you use these kind of parameterizations. So, as a sneak peek, the next paper will be talking about the benefits of maximum update parameterization over any other kind of parameterizations, enabling you to do things that you probably didn't think it was possible before. Uh, by doing so. So, uh, okay, so that was a long version, but the short version is yes, yes, you should use maximum update parameterization, but I'll tell you why you should use it in the next paper. Gotcha. The motivating question, or the motivation for that question for me was just that my intuition that I got from reading the, uh, like the derivations of the maximal update and why the other parameterizations fail was that essentially it's a matter of gradient flow like either the gradients all get soaked up by the top layer or they don't make it all the way to the first layer. Um, and yeah. it's so that those are problems that you can imagine. Obviously, I mean, constants are important in that case. It's really just a scale between the first layer's gradients and the last layer's gradients. It's not a difference of like zero versus non-zero versus infinite. And so that's the kind of phenomenon I was trying to get at with that question. Yeah, so you're, are you so maybe concretely you're asking uh, perhaps in practice, it's okay, or maybe even beneficial to have imbalance between the gradients of different layers. Yeah, I think that's that's one way to put it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's a that's a good question, and uh, I I believe that that's probably you know a valid uh, question, and that's probably true in some cases or many cases. Um, it's an empirical question. Uh, I think that. Uh, can be looked at. Um, of course, now, like in the context of this paper and infinite with limits, uh, of course, um, I think it doesn't make sense, right? If you, for example, you have a three layer neural network, but you parameterize it so that in the infinite width limit, your first layers just don't move. Uh, then it's kind of a shame that you have all these parameters, you didn't actually use them. So, um, like, so while I agree with your sentiment that maybe the imbalance helps, the way I will implement this imbalance is actually to parameterize things in the maximum update uh, framework. But you have constants that you can adjust so that you can adjust how much gradient is going to the first layer versus the second layer rather than like, you know, putting them in a standard parameterization where, and, you know, when the infinite with, when you go to infinite with limit, the first layer just don't learn at all. You know, like you just, you can essentially leave money on the table if you use any other kind of parameterization. Um, 
That makes sense. A uh, question from the audience uh, asking about the intuition in the second backward pass with SGD and how that's different. Um, like, uh, and in particular, is there a way to think of what's going on, the difference in the distributions as being something like a prior or something like that? Okay, so let's go back to that slide. Um, something like this, I guess. Uh, okay, so uh, the question was uh, how to understand the, the backward pass and, uh, and if there's a prior, it corresponds to some kind of prior. Yeah, the question here, I'll just read it out. What's the intuition behind the sequent backward pass in SGD and how are the Gaussian process utilized here? I think that might be a bit of a confusion, uh, perhaps as priors. I see. Um, so I would say that I'm not using really anything about the Gaussian process here. Uh, so in particular, uh, like I mentioned very briefly at the end, if you're in the feature, a feature learning limit, then initialization, you have a trivial Gaussian process in the sense that your variance is zero. Uh, you, you're, you have a delta distribution uh, at the zero function. Um, so, so I'm not using anything about the Gaussian process. Uh, I am uh, using the fact that U and V are Gaussian initialized initialization with variance one over N. Um, and uh, yeah, in terms of intuition for the backward pass, uh, here, so here I'm not uh, using anything special. Like here I'm just literally doing, I don't know, like a manual derivation of backprop. Uh, so uh, like there's nothing complicated here. So the statement that the gradients uh, uh, the first layer, sorry, second layer is first layer weights times the, the loss derivative times the input. This is just, uh, just straightforward from backprop. If you do backprop manually, this is what you get. Very, very straightforward. Uh, and as, as soon as you have this identity, uh, you can see that because, you know, like this blue, uh, the first layer blue weights, you know, they, they're essentially copy into the second layer gradients. Uh, and because these two scalars are roughly deterministic, you have uh, approximately ID coordinates in this gradient. And similarly for the first layer, and then you can kind of iteratively uh, push forward this observation to every future step in the training process. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Uh, yeah, and there's uh, some more questions. Uh, one, um, are there any punchlines with regard to sparsity here? Um, so there is a paper in the last ICML that talked about like transfer with the neural tangent kernel and sparsity. Uh, so I, I think I've seen that paper, but I don't remember um, exactly what it is. So uh, I guess in, so I would say the following, um, I think a lot of papers nowadays, they do um, experiments on CIFAR 10, uh, but my point of view, like especially after this paper is that that's not a good data set to do experiments on if you care about feature learning because kernels do so well on it that um, like whatever you do on that, like this includes, you know, for example, uh, new architecture search, uh, whatever you do on it, um, it's kind of like you're not, in some sense, you're, yeah, you're, you're, um, uh, you're not isolating the effect of feature learning. Right? So for example, if you were to do, um, architecture search on ImageNet or uh, spark, like do pruning on ImageNet, I think that's uh, a lot more meaningful in the sense that um, in the CIFAR 10 case, uh, when you, I think when you try to induce sparsity, yeah, it suffices to just approximate the neural tangent kernel. And, you know, from like the sketching literature, whatever, there's a lot of uh, these, um, um, uh, I guess like projection literature, which which essentially just deals with sparsity. Uh, you can do do a lot of things with that by just 
try to approximate NTK from a, a very, uh, yeah, just try to approximate using sparse uh, using sparse weights uh, very efficiently. You can you know get away. You can get pretty good performance on these uh, smaller data sets. But as soon as you go to larger data sets, I think these things won't work because you can't just approximate a, a fixed kernel. You essentially have to, um, yeah, like uh, you have to find uh, the right architecture to do the right feature learning. So. Um, yeah, I don't know. That was a rambling. I don't know. I'm not sure if I answered your question. It looked like, yeah, they responded in the chat um, that they like the answer. Um, okay, great. Thanks. One question I wanted to ask uh, was about computing all this stuff, because you mentioned that you made use of that construction that you showed uh, in order to do the word to vec calculations. Uh, and then there's also some sections where you talk about the computational scaling. And it seems like it's really unfavorable. Um, uh, so I'm just curious, what thoughts do you have in that direction in terms of actually like starting yeah. to use infinite width networks? Yeah, um, so we'll have papers later on about this topic. Uh, but uh, the, the gist is that um, kind of like, you know, in Bayesian literature, exact base is essentially intractable. You can't do it other than the simple cases. But I mean, there's still like entire industry academically uh, behind it. And and the gist there is that if you're creative, you can approximate uh, the Bayesian uh, inference using some clever ways, right? And that uh, strikes a middle ground between uh, efficiency and the, the optimality of inference. And uh, in this case, it's very similar. You can come up with different approximations uh, to the infinite width limit which is not as trivial as just training a really wide neural network, um, but still kind of um, like goes part of the way to the infinite width limit. And you can also think about uh, different kinds of limit to take and so on and so forth. So there's a lot, if you're creative, you can do a lot of things in this area. Hmm. Um, one thing it seemed to me from reading through the way that you were doing the actual calculations was that the tricky parts are evaluating a bunch of expectations for correlated random variables. So it sounds like essentially the trouble there is going to be doing efficient integration rather than doing like efficient and effective derivatives as you have in like normal finite width networks. Um, yeah, so if you, yeah, so generically speaking, right, like if you have just some kind of computation graph, you want to just take the infinite width limit of that, yeah, you're going to end up with some really nasty integrals you want to solve. So if you want to have a black box um, limit taker, then you need to have a really, really good integration solver. Um, but of course, you know, like what I just said, if you just care about a very specific case, not a black box setting, like I just want to train, I don't know, like infinite width bird like where the infinite width could be some approximation of infinite width. Maybe I can come up with some approximation of it that works pretty well and doesn't have to do this black box integration solving. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, uh, I see that. Um, though there was also a mention that the, uh, that the correlation structure itself can be very complicated. I don't remember the exact details, but that it can become like, uh, yeah, like an exponential number of, polyno of polynomial terms or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's another difficulty. Yes, uh, but the answer is the same. If you're creative, you can uh, ameliorize uh, those problems. Yeah, no, it sounds like a really exciting direction for future work. I think. Um, yeah, like I, I definitely to... encourage people to think about how to do those approximations. Uh, and I mean, I really think the analogy with the base case is very similar. Uh, it's really apt. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. There's a, I guess, yeah, my interest in neural networks partly developed because I got interested in like Bayesian inference, found out about how intractable exact Bayes on graphs was, uh, was not that enthused by the approximations and then ran into the arms of neural networks as a way to do, <laughs> you know, effective machine learning um, yeah. without running into those problems. But yeah, now you can kind of go a little bit back. Maybe. I've been I've been I've been sneakily drawn back into the to the field <laughs> of, of integration and, and inference. That's it. Uh, yeah. Um, I guess one 
one last question, I guess, before we go here. Um, so with finite width networks, when you increase the number of parameters, you often have to worry about overfitting. Um, so is that, uh, is that something that we don't expect to happen with infinite width due to something like the double descent phenomenon? Or uh, like to what extent do you have to worry about overfitting in infinite width networks? Yeah, this is a very, very good question. Uh, so the short answer, I believe you need to uh, take into account overfitting. Um, so uh, in particular, um, in contrast with the kernel case, right, where in some sense, like your, um, yeah, there's some inductive bias. I mean, it's, I mean, I guess so does the feature learning case, but in the, in the kernel case, it kind of like, in some sense, the capacity is kind of fixed in some sense. Um, I, I don't know, like very intuitively compared to feature learning, like feature learning is more wiggle room. You know, you can learn more things, but of course you can also overfit more things. So um, you're gonna, you have, you will run into overfitting for sure. Like for our experiments, um, we have weight decay on and that like essentially, uh, that means that we didn't, um, uh, you know, run into the case where the, um, uh, the, the the wider neural networks actually do worse on the evaluation. Um, but in general, I think this is true that you need to take into account uh, overfitting, how to take care of overfitting uh, in the wider neural networks. Um, with that said, um, in the modern you know trend of training larger and larger neural networks on larger and larger data sets, uh, with the prime example being BERT and GPT and so on, we're actually not at the point where the model is large enough to actually overfit the data set significantly. So, uh, so in that sense, if you're going in that direction, uh, I think we don't need to worry too much about overfitting at this point. Uh, we just give, because like the data is so much larger than the possible model we can train. Um, but yeah, for smaller things, you know, if you care about something like CIFAR 10 size, or even you know even um, when you fine tune bird on downstream tasks, the small data sets you're gonna run into a lot of overfitting. You had to you had to really be careful about regularizers. And you know if you if you write papers, you know that you know for you know glue or super glue like fine tuning on the smaller data sets is all about regularization. Uh, so in that sense, you know without even going to infinite with limit, you know for large neural networks you're gonna run into this issue. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, so that's all the time we have. So I'll uh, I'll let you go, uh, Greg, and our audience. Thanks for thanks for coming uh, and uh, presenting your work. I'm really excited to see where this goes, where people take these, um, you know, start uh, coming up with smart ways to approximate this, calculate this, and make use of this uh, as a new tool in our toolkit for working with neural networks. Yeah, thanks, man. Yeah, I like like you. I'm very excited about this work, and uh, I'm uh, very excited to see what the community does with it. All right, uh, thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs>